is your host, Benjamin Saxton, and welcome to a Fighter's Chance podcast, where we give people in the combat sports world an opportunity to talk about the things worth fighting for. So today's guest, boxer, professional MMA fighter. You've seen her in Bellator. She's a featherweight contender. Janae Harding, how are you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing very good. I'm happy to talk with you today. We got lots of lots of different things that we can talk about, but I want to today. I want to talk about your history, kind of moving from New Zealand to Australia, how you found um, martial arts. I, I know you kind of have a karate, maybe a little bit of a karate type background. So maybe talk a little bit about that, um, how that transitioned to uh, your professional side of it, and then. Um, it, it, from your other interviews, I've kind of got the sense that you like to stay active. So you kind of dabbled into boxing some, you're kind of doing mixed martial arts. So kind of we'll just kick it off with uh, how you got started with mixed martial arts. Was that in New Zealand or did you kind of find that in Australia? Um, it was in Australia. Um, and like you said, I did have a karate background beforehand, but um, that also started in Australia. It was sort of um, mom and I, I think we just, tried like every sport under the sun until we found one that I kind of had a bit more of a like fit with. So I really found like, I really gravitated towards martial arts when I started karate and I really enjoyed that. I think individual aspect of it, um, which was really good, but unfortunately um, for me, it was just a little bit too westernized and I didn't really feel like I was getting the martial arts discipline that you see on the karate kid I guess so therefore I wanted something that was like a little bit more challenging and a little bit more ethical I think in a sense um that kind of paid a little bit more homage to like something I just I think a little bit more routine a little bit more specific where you didn't just pay a specific number and get a a belt color so therefore um it just so happened that my mom was working around the corner from my MMA gym at the time and um, we went in there and I stayed there for like about seven years, I think. Um, and that was on the Gold Coast. Um, I was 15 when I started. So, yeah, quite young. Okay. And, and you- I mean, I walked in and the whole class was obviously males and that kind of thing. Um, but my coach at the time, Vincent Perry, he's the guy that I started with. Um, he's about like, he was in his like early 50s when I got there. And um, he's a very relaxed guy. Um, I mean, it is the Gold Coast. He's a coast coastal guy so um but he plays like guitar and um, okay always is re- very well known for wearing a hat and that kind of thing so I feel like it just his energy was perfect um and a perfect place for me to start because he just kind of was like I'll look after you if um I will never let you fight unless you're ready um oh, basically nice. just promised my mom that I would be okay and and looked after and feel comfortable in an environment like that and yeah And it really was like, it was perfect place for me. I had a lot of um, older friends and and a good community there that I kind of helped me grow up at the same time. So um, I really thank MMA for a lot of things in my life. Yeah, that's pretty, I mean, not everybody's been as lucky as you in that regards where uh, I've talked to other fighters where they've kind of maybe gotten a promoter or something that kind of blows smoke at them when they're first starting out, you know, you're the best of everything. And then they kind of get into bad situations, but that, that's great that you kind of, you found somebody that kind of put them on, put yourself under their wing and kind of guided you. You mentioned that you've dabbled in other sports or tried different things. What were some of the other things that you tried that you liked, or maybe that you're like, hell no, I'm not, I'm not doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I literally everything. So um, one of the one of the things I was better at and was kind of the sport that I took over from New Zealand to Australia um, was hockey. I was I was like it's a very popular sport in New Zealand. Um, I'm talking grass hockey too because okay. um, we don't or turf because um, we don't do a, a lot of ice hockey. Um, so therefore, like yeah, when I, I think I maybe started hockey when I was probably about five or so, and and I was doing that through throughout coming to Australia and I moved to Australia when I was about 10 so um that was sort of like I came over and I did when I started school I I just put myself in hockey um as an extracurricular and it was sort of I guess it was sort of like comfortable for me but it wasn't something that I was like super passionate about I was just I'm an athletic person so I, I kind of put a lot of things up anyway um but another thing like and I was also pretty good at touch football those two things are very like very popular Kiwi sports for one. And then, um, and then yeah, two things I was quite good at. And then, but I tried like 
hip hop dance. Um, and I just, I, I'm not a very good, I'm a very introverted person, especially when I was younger, I wasn't very kind of outgoing and that kind of thing. So to perform in front of people wasn't really my thing. Um, I think that's why I kind of gravitated away from that. Um, and then, I mean, I did guitar a lot as well when I was younger. That was mainly because my dad was really good at guitar. So it was sort of just something that I thought I would pick up. He was really um, musically gifted. Do like um, a little jam sessions, you and your dad. Yeah, okay. something where we could kind of like connect a little bit more and, and um, that kind of thing. But the funny thing was um, my dad came over and my mom was like, oh, I put her in guitar. She started guitar, blah, blah, blah. And um, he was like, oh, I don't know how to read music. And she was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, I was like, well, how do you know how to play? And he was like, I just listen to songs That's and cool. I can play them. And so it was sort of like that kind of crashed our party a little bit because we couldn't necessarily like, he couldn't teach me what I was learning because I had a different teacher and it just didn't quite work out. But I was, I was really enjoying that for a little bit. Um, but yeah, I did, I did basketball. I did, I did literally everything. And it was just like, it was as an only child and my mom being a single parent was just keeping me busy, basically. Yeah. Just keeping me busy after school, keeping me involved in whatever I can get involved in and, and kind of doing as much as I can. Do you think um, your athletics helped you with uh, being an intro? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know if you ever really grow out of that. It's, I mean, it's kind of just a personality. You just yeah. learn to adjust. So how yeah. was that? Um, you know, I'm sure athletics did help you with that, but as you kind of gotten older and – become a professional in a sport where all eyes are on you and it's you and another person there's no one to hide behind so how have you, how have you dealt with that I mean even interviews like this I mean sometimes people just close off they don't interact yeah it's strange I think um I think I started MMA at a really good time specifically because it was sort of that out of school community that I could look to and I could speak with and we we have obviously in every martial arts gym you have like quite a mix of people and I think for that reason I had a lot of maturity around me which helped mm -hmm. me mature and um and and a lot of people from different walks of life so I sort of just um understood that if I can speak to these guys and I can have conversations with these guys and um I guess I can if, if I really enjoy something like MMA as well it's not that hard to perform and therefore like now these days um I think as I grew up, I, I realized that I was good at public speaking, but not necessarily good at, say, performing in something that I'm uncomfortable with or mm. like I'm not 100% about. So I think something like hip hop was just like a little bit too many eyes on me and I was a little bit younger. Um, but now, as I grew up and having that community, it really just matured me and, and gave me kind of, I guess, that inner sense of like confidence, I guess, that I could, I could perform and speak to people and kind of be the center of attention without... Um, without it sort of being nerve wracking. I think, I think now my introverted personality is just sort of just, I'm just not as social as I guess a lot of people. And I don't, I just stay, I would rather stay home and play video games than I guess go out and, um, and party and whatnot. Um, but that also kind of comes with martial arts because we don't go out drinking all the time. We like, it's just not part of the lifestyle. You can't really I mean, some have proven that you kind of can, but not a lot of <laughs> us can um, prove that you can party and fight, you know, professionally, right. especially. So it's sort of good for me that I guess like I, I can kind of have like a month where all eyes are on me and it's fight camp and I get interviews and that kind of thing. And fight week is all important and, and a lot of photos and that kind of stuff. But the rest of the time I can kind of chill out. So it comes in waves and it, yeah. it's good enough for my social media meter to kind of like not get too full as per se. So yeah, it's that's, good. Yeah, that's good. Cause then, you know, it kind of law averages, right? You have all that attention and then it goes away. Then you can kind of do your own thing and then kind of come yeah. back. Um, you know, as an, you know, I, I was an athlete, not to this, obviously to the same level, but I, I was always curious. So when you're in the octagon, you know, you, you, zone out right i'm assuming you're you're zoning out onto your opponent how much do you hear of the crowd when you are fighting do you does that come in and out like like and maybe i, I imagine maybe after a, like a huge knockout or some a good finish does the crowd come in or is there that pause that kind of calm where all of a sudden then it kind of comes back to you i feel like um my first few fights i never heard anyone and then I think as I got more comfortable, more experienced and yeah, more comfortable in the cage as per se, 
um, it would kind of come in and out, like you're saying, like, I guess if there's like a lull in the fight, maybe we're clinching on the cage, you just take that one deep breath or whatever, and that kind of opens everyone mm. up to come in. Or like you quickly see outside of the cage, and you're like, oh, there's people there. Or like, oh, there's a ring girl there or something like yeah. that. Like something random. And then straight away you kind of get sucked back in because it's like the action starts going again and, and maybe you break off the cage or take down or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I think now like where I am at and trying to be mindful within my fights, I think um, kind of comes in and out. And But it's in control for me. And it's only, I only kind of let it in when I, have a spare second to kind of let more information kind of come in if that makes sense whereas like yeah. most of the time I do just want to be concentrating on what's going on yeah I mean I I gotta imagine you're never like intentionally thinking about like the crowd or the sound I just uh I just know that sometimes it can kind of come in and out and then if it ever in impacts the fight because sometimes you'll hear uh, a crowd could impact a referee right so if <laughs> let's say I'm not saying these are your fights. I'm just saying if you're, you're you see a fight and they're clinching and then a crowd becomes I don't know uh, disgruntled, we'll just say, and then they start yeah. yelling stuff, and then you that will put pressure on the referee to maybe break it up or maybe force you to be faster at changing your position than you would have previously. So, have you ever experienced that in the octagon where that has dictated maybe some of the fight? Um, I'm I think I'm lucky that. I sort of, I, I know that when I fight, I fight for me and I don't owe, I don't owe the spectators anything. Um, but that being said, I'm always someone who really likes to push the, the yeah. action. Like even if, even if it's kind of for whatever reason, especially in my first few fights, even if it's in a bad way, like even if I'm pushing at a time where I should be probably resting or taking a couple of breaths or that kind of thing, I am kind of just someone who just wants to keep stuff going um right. and i think like that's why i think my a lot of my fans enjoy my fights even the ones yeah. that i've lost because they are such wars and they're such back and forth and and that kind of thing but um but at the same time like it's not it's not the crowd that gives me pressure it's sort of my own mentality like i want to keep doing yeah. stuff i want to keep progressing whether it's positive or negative i just like keep moving um in a sense so so yeah so it's like it's like i don't because i've seen fights and it and I've been to fights live where the crowd's booing or whatever. And it's, it's something as simple as some, just a little bit more groundwork or a little bit more grappling right. than you would expect. And you're just kind of like, you can't disrespect any fighter that walks right. in the cage because everyone deserves the respect of you going in and watching them and getting, paying attention. So therefore it's sort of like, um, I do kind of get frustrated when I see other people boo things that shouldn't yeah. be booed or, I mean, nobody should be booed. It doesn't matter how boring the fight is. It doesn't matter. Crowd, if it's the crowds crowd, can be done. No matter what it is, like you're, there's still a technical aspect to every fight. Oh yeah. And um, they're still taking damage for the sake of your viewers, like entertainment. So, um, I sort of, I'm, I think I'm lucky in that sense where that's not my mentality. I don't necessarily care too much about the spectators, but I, I love to put on a good show. But I know I kind of do that subconsciously anyway. So. Right. Works. And well, and that's one of the things that I like about your fights too. And anybody that hasn't seen your fights, I strongly suggest to go check it out because you do push the issue. It is always entertaining. When it, yeah. you you on a card usually ends up being one of the more entertaining fights on the card. Yeah. Uh, so no, that I definitely appreciate that of just forcing the action and forcing that. Uh, pressure, whether, um, you know, you're trying to make a mistake or just enforce whatever your game plan is on the other person. So that's, uh, that's always fun to watch. With, with your, with your fighting in Bellator, you know, you had quite a few fights now in Bellator. How many fights do you have left on your contract? Do you have a few more? Um, so I've already had four so far and, um, that contract was a five fight contract, but I instead, um, I re-signed before the last fight. So, okay. um, I have another four on my new contract. So yeah. That's awesome. And That's you, were, you were supposed to, weren't you supposed to fight in May? Was it this, this year, yeah. right? And COVID kind of shut it down. Yeah. So, um, that was in London against Liam McCourt. Yep. Um, and that obviously was going to be such a fun fight, um, for me. And I was really looking forward to it, but yeah. It was to be expected as well. It was sort of like booked in the time when everything had kind of started anyway. So it was sort of 
it was booked, but it was also in the back of your mind. You're kind of like, oh, it would most likely not go through, especially um, around then. And then, yeah, and then as soon as the UK shut down, it was all a no-go. But, um, but yeah, um, and the only unfortunate thing is that she has just gotten surgery on her shoulder. So, um, unfortunately, if I were to be matched up again, it wouldn't be with her. But hopefully when she comes back, I think we both want to honour that match up and, and still fight each other so hopefully soon. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. How How is training for that type of fight? Knowing, because that's, that's a different type of matchup, right? You know, you're, this, mm. this, this whole world is different, but you're, you're going into it. You're like, okay, I got this fight. It's going to be a really good fight, but I have to train. I have to train like I am going to fight, but there's a, there's a realistic chance that this is canceling. So how do you, how do you balance that? Do you just train with the mindset of that's not even an option? Pretty much. Like I, I just sort of was just like kind of ignore the idea that it's not going to be, going through and and it was uh, the positive was that it, um things hadn't really shut down in australia as well yet so all my gyms were still open i okay. could kind of just act like everything was normal and i could just go to the sessions as per normal and it didn't kind of make any difference i mean the only thing i did was um just add a little bit more judo into mm. my game um and work with one of my friends um that's um a very good judoka in australia so um that was really the only difference like I, I i was just like it was in the back of my mind but i didn't pay too much attention because i knew the more i kind of i guess elaborated on it it would have just spiraled into me being a little bit less motivated so um i was just like i'll just wait until i get the call and i mean it still was early days when i got the call it's not like i was two weeks out or whatever or a week out um i still got the call maybe like four or five weeks out and I was like okay that's fair enough this is kind of where I would have ramped it up even more anyway right so, yeah it wasn't too stressful the only thing was like you were just kind of like is it going to be without a crowd is it going to be mm-hmm. um am I going to be quarantined when I go over to the UK like what were the unknowns that were a little bit freaky because you're just really not sure like how much extra work we had to put in um around this COVID thing but um but it all kind of worked out yeah, and with Bellator kind of, you know, starting back up again, has there been any discussions for another fight? Or is that, you know, still just waiting? Because it's still so new where there are only, what, one or two events in now. So is it, it you is have any discussions? Sort of new. Yeah, it's kind of just like um, – it was more like they needed a sort of the international travel and I didn't know what was going on with that. Um, but I'm kind of lucky. I'm very close with, um, like, in the way of training with Arlene um, over here. So um, it's kind of good because we're both on the same boat in the sense of international travel. We're both coming from the same port to the same port. Um, if they continue to just have the shows in Mohegan. Um, but at the moment, I'm, I just have been pushing my manager, obviously. Now that everyone's started back, I'm like, please get my name into the mix as much as possible. And obviously don't let the idea that Leah um, is in surgery kind of hold me back from any other matchups. I was like, these are kind of the other people that I would, anyone really, but anyone I would like to fight. But I know that um, these would be the kind of people that I would like to fight. And um, and I think now they have sort of their international travel. So yeah, it is kind of day by day with their new shows and um and hopefully um they'll announce a couple of other venues maybe and then that would possibly make it a little bit easier but yeah yeah well those that are if there's any that are listening let's get you a fight and uh you know let's let's get you on a card soon yeah um what would you say you know i just i'm i'm just curious because you've had uh quite a few professional bouts you've had some wars in the octagon um or the cage so what would you say is uh, one of the fights that you've kind of faced the most adversity, whether it was something that you weren't expecting going into the fight? Maybe you thought it was going to go one way and it went in a 90 degree way, a uh, d- different direction, or maybe it was just you got rocked or something along those lines where you had to overcome it. Um, probably my debut with Bellator was a bit of a, um, like adversity kind of fight. It was um, three round war against Amber Labra. And um, I think I was just getting used to, one, the travel. Like, I'd never traveled that far for a fight. I've, I've fought in Asia. Um, mm-hmm. but that's a lot different to going all the way to the States. So, um, and I, I mean, we were in San Jose. It was such a lovely place, and it was such a great venue um, for me, the SAP Center. And then I think um, just as I was walking out, I was just like, okay, wow. This was not, <laughs> like, this was sort of, like, 
not what I had in mind um, at the SAP Center specifically. Like I've fought in smaller arenas yeah. since then, but since it is in California, it is in San Jose, there was like a fair few people, important people, I suppose, say there. And um, I think instead of dealing with it during the week, I thought I was de dealing with it, mm. um, but um, but not really consciously paying attention to it. And then it all sort of hit as I was walking out, which is the last kind of place that you want it to happen. Um, and then, of course, like, for that reason, I just feel like I wasn't as mindful, I wasn't as present for the fight, and therefore I wasn't problem solving, and I wasn't mm. making the best decisions. I was just sort of going through the motions. Um, and as much as I, obviously, I didn't get knocked down or anything, and it wasn't the worst performance ever, I just, like, watching it back, I just, I just wasn't making any decisions, and it's just sort of like a mindless... Um, activity and and that's not necessarily positive for especially against someone like Amber who was already a pretty notable opponent for me at the time so um, and pretty much like every fight I'll be the the underdog which I'm okay with but um, even more so I knew that I could be her and I just didn't pull the trigger and I didn't do the things that I should have done and it's just kind of it was more frustrating and it was frustrating in the fight which is kind of like something that I've never really experienced mm. just being in between rounds just being like well, like what am i doing like I'm, and nothing is like, like okay. clicking to go and do it um which was really um silly but in in a same sense it, it, it taught me a lot and it made me kind of a little bit more focused on being mindful and present for every fight making sure i take the time at the back to meditate or get into the mode or whatever it is and shut out the the crowd like we were saying um, and not let it allow kind of hmm. yet to affect my performance. So that would be. That's, that's interesting. So, you know, you can train all you want. You can get, you can put weight on, you can get stronger, you can get, phys you can get faster. The physical training, the, the, the physical aspect of fighting, you know, that's, that's very real. You can see it. You can physically see it. How have you evolved and sharpened your mental IQ or your fight IQ alongside the physical side? Because that always, that always interests me on how fighters can evolve because it's not just physical, right? You're, you're just as good as your fight, fight IQ because that eventually will catch up with you. Like you said, your first fight, your things weren't clicking. You're not able to make those adjustments. So what did you do to evolve you um, or evolve your fight IQ? Um, I think just getting as much competition behind me as possible i think nothing can kind of compare to cage time or just experience um especially competition experience being in that mode where it's time to switch on whatever it is if it's jujitsu if it's boxing i've done muay thai fights as well i just kind of not only wanted to do it for staying active but just another way to kind of gain experience without it affecting my mma record um and i think like especially in the last year I've sort of had so many revelations just of, of understanding how much more important it is to be smart about your fights rather than I guess stronger or faster or whatever it is right. it like the most important thing especially in this now evolving kind of MMA trend that we're in at the moment it's sort of just all about fight IQ and it's about making the best decisions the best game plans against the best people and 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 counteracting things and and being present kind of comes with that because when you're in the fight you do want to be making those decisions consciously and adjusting consciously as things are going along um which is hard to do with adrenaline and a crowd right. and cameras and all that kind of stuff um sometimes you just sort of especially i think in my first few fights my amateur fights especially i just sort of rode on the fact that I was athletic and I was naturally pretty gifted. So therefore I, I knew that if I switched off, my fight would happen and it would, it would right. work out. And it did. Like, I mean, I, I got a few first round TKOs and that kind of thing. And um, that's all positive. But once you start fighting harder and more notable opponents, you really need to be making these decisions consciously. And, um, and I think since then it's just really helped me. I mean, that as much as I didn't win my last fight against Amanda, um, I feel like I, I did win up until like the last couple of minutes of the fight or maybe the last round of the fight. Um, and I, and I was making those decisions a lot more. And I mean, um, the things that I took away from that weren't the same as the previous fights before that. So, um, so therefore I knew that there was improvements in my mindset and, and therefore, um, the decisions that I was making. So I was really happy about that in a sense. 
And I think, um, yeah, now I prioritize the right things. Just, just making sure my headspace during the week and, and during the day is positive and, and going to make me kind of switch on the best. Well, that's good to hear because, you know, you, you never want to lose, right? You, you, regardless of however it is, a decision, knockout, submission, you never want to lose. But I think it would be even worse if you lose and then you're like, I, I didn't get anything out of that fight, right? You know, yeah. like, there's no there's no good takeaways. It's not like you just was a one-punch knockout, you know. It, I can't really remember, like, as yeah. well. Like, I don't know what just happened. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, th yeah, that's that, that's good. At least there's there's some of the takeaway, and you can say like, all right, I progress here, or I could do something different there. And you know, there's an actionable thing in there that will help you for your next fight. Yeah, and I'm still young too, so I'm, I'm oh, absolutely. Lucky. Like, I'm I'm kind of like, I'm in that phase of learning. Like, I'm in that phase of getting the experience behind me and and kind of getting the fight IQ that I need to fight these guys. And I mean, like being in Australia, it means I didn't kind of get the same experience that they did, but, but I am lucky in a sense where I can be like, all right, now what do I need to do to get there or beat these people without the experience behind me? And it's kind of, that's what I really think it comes down to my mindset. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You have plenty of years of fighting ahead of you. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not like you're, you know, 30, in, the 30, in the late 30s or something like that where uh, mm. you, you got a 10, 15 years of solid fights to go. Um, and you probably would have fought two times by now if uh, it was a normal year. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, let's switch gears a little bit. I mean, we talked about fighting. We talked a little about you. Um, Outside of fighting, you mentioned some hobbies, you know, when you were younger, you played the guitar, you like to stay home, you play some video games, mm -hmm. uh, not a big part of your, what, if you're not fighting, what, what's like your, what's your hobby? What do you like to do? Um, oh, it's kind of been like the last couple of years specifically, um, I was traveling for such a long time. So therefore, like, I feel like the last couple of years I've only just kind of settled like I've just kind of reestablished my base um fixed up my house and and filled it with furniture and, and kind of got my life sorted in a sense um so there wasn't really much time for hobbies and that kind of thing but um but now I'm really looking to do more twitching um and doing more video games and that kind of thing um I have always kind of been a gamer but I guess when you travel you sort of put these things down because you, yeah. you can't necessarily have the extras um and um, yeah, now I'm really enjoying gaming and kind of giving it a different platform where I can interact with my fans and, and kind of speak to everyone and be just as per normal as, as I would like to be and um, kind of as transparent as I, I have tried to be. Um, and therefore, yeah, and I can also enjoy it. And it's sort of a good relaxing downer time. Um, obviously, I try to work on the other aspects of my life like being a little bit more educated and, and that kind of thing um and I'll probably go back to study um within the next kind of couple of months because um where I'm located right now is really close to a couple of institutes and therefore I can kind of go back to studying um I'll kind of introduce myself slowly into into studying after being out of school for so long um and then hopefully yeah do a little bit more stuff like that just to keep my brain active and and kind of stay on top of it now that I have more free time and I'm a little bit more settled and I'm not worried about getting a car or um yeah adding furniture to my house and that kind of stuff so so yeah just sort of working on normal life things and then and mainly the twitch stuff yeah what type of uh you know do you have a preference in gaming like what type of games do you like to play um Fortnite mainly, okay. <laughs> mainly right. like a lot of Fortnite because I mean, I, everyone always requests Warzone um, or, um, yeah, Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Um, and it's like, I, I like playing those games, but um, I much more prefer, like, Fortnite. Like, I came up I came up on the Crash Bandicoots and um, Ratchet and & Clank and, and Spyro and that kind of thing. And I, I will probably end up twitching those kind of things later on. But at the moment, I'm just really working on getting better at Fortnite. <laughs> and um, I'm really enjoying that game, too. Like, I, my boyfriend started me on it and then all of a sudden I'm like borderline addicted to it so yeah <laughs> so Fortnite is the main one 